Winter began in August, or so it always seemed to her. Always, from the very first sight of it, she hated the cottage. She loathed the plain, square red brick box, its blue slate roof, the black hen coops, falling fences and apple trees in sprawling decay that passed for a garden, the muddy pond at the foot of it, and the three withered willows sticking nakedly up from the water. She hated the long Friday evening drive out of town to what her husband fondly called the simple life. No telephone, no television, no radio, no rat race, no appointments. Just you and the sky and, my God, the air. With certainty, she knew every Friday as they came to the end of the field track and within sight of the cottage, what his first syllable, first gesture would be. Ah, that air. The immense exhaled sigh blew itself from his big, loose mouth like a breath of sea wind. By God, Stella, you can fairly taste the sea in that air. The air, winter and summer, always seemed to her like ice. Always from across the flat grey dikes came the quiet, clenching cold, and always, five minutes after arriving, she started steadily drinking. Her first immediate pleasure after the stimulating lick of gin was to draw the curtains and put on all the lights. The privacy of the world thus secured, together with the gin, made her for a time quite affable, even good-humoured. But always, by ten o'clock or so, the last trace of affability, even civility, was dead. She began to be loose-lipped, strident. I tell you once and for all, Mr. Barty Bartholomew, this is the last time I come down to this rotten, stinking hole. I don't live in privies. I'm not used to buckets in the yard. Once, in a fit of gibbering fury, she let a burning cigarette fall from her lips and lodge in the collar of her fur coat, where it incredibly set up a fire which she allowed to burn for a full minute before he realised the danger and started swiping it out with both hands. Oh, let me burn. I might just as well burn. In such scenes, her face became a grey-green mask. It began to be impossible to tell how old she was. Her 35 years became 45, 50. Somewhere beyond the drawn curtains, four or five miles away, was the sea. Some distance along the coast, a new power station brooded like a windowless concrete castle. You could hear, from time to time, both day and night, the moaning bleat of foghorns. She woke at midday one day to an unexpected, astonishing sight, a deep, late-march snow. With cold disbelief, she stood and stared at it from the bedroom window. Already the sun had begun to melt it on the southward side of the house. The roof was dripping like a running spring. From outside, she heard presently the sound of voices and then of scraping shovels. She looked down to see, below, on the garden path, a rosy, perspiring Bartholomew, heartily shoveling snow. And with him, a dark-haired boy of seventeen or so, sweeping up behind him with a birch broom. Wearing her fur coat over her nightgown against the cold, she went downstairs. As she started to boil a kettle for coffee, Bartholomew put his head round the kitchen door with cheerful explanations. It's Mrs. Blackburn's son, Roger. His mother slipped down and busted a small bone in her foot. She sent him along to see if he could help at all. It's a hell of a snow. She said she was sorry about Mrs. Blackburn, who came in twice at weekends and once in the week. It was very civil of her to be so thoughtful as to send the boy. Ah, coffee. Smells marvellous. It's what we could do with. The boy's been shoveling and sweeping since eight o'clock. I expect he could do with some breakfast, too. Ask him, will you? I'll cook him eggs or something. A quarter of an hour later, the three of them were sitting at the kitchen table, the two men scooping ravenously at plates of fried breakfast, she with nothing but a cup of black coffee in her hands, her elbows crooked on the table. The penetration of the boy's exceptionally bright blue eyes was the first thing that struck her about him. She found her gaze constantly drawn back to those eyes. Let me cook you some more, she said at last. It won't take a moment. We're very chipper this morning, aren't we? Bartholomew said. Bright as a skylark. Was she, she said. She hadn't noticed it. She supposed it was the snow. The word skylark suddenly caused the boy to stop eating. Shyly, he said that in fact skylarks were singing already. He'd heard one only yesterday. What do they look like, she said. I've never seen one. 
Sheer disbelief at this confession of hers kept him for some moments from giving an answer. Then he said that he wouldn't be surprised if they even sang today in the snow. The sun was warm enough. If they did, he'd point it out to her. That would be marvellous, she said. Bartholomew laughed. Ah, oh, we'll be having you taking up ornithology any moment now, he said. Under Roger's tuition, eh, Roger? You don't see many birds here, she said. Oh, there she was wrong, the boy said. The marsh was full of birds, all kinds of birds. Waders, herons, kingfishers, even wild geese sometimes. Well, we must be off, Bartholomew said. Any more for the skylark? Roger hasn't finished his breakfast yet. Don't rush the boy. Can't wait. Must off. For some ten minutes more, she remained alone with the boy. She started to light a cigarette and promptly dropped the box of matches on the kitchen floor. The boy rushed to pick it up. He struck a match and lit it for her. Thank you, Roger. That's very sweet of you. He went back to his plate quickly, without a word. Do tell your mother how sorry I am. She won't be able to work for some time? No, but that was all right. She didn't worry about that. He would come instead. He at last finished his breakfast and went outside, saying, as he did so, that he would call her if and when he heard a skylark. Suddenly she felt impelled to go upstairs and dress. She found herself putting on a green tweed costume, brushing and spraying her hair, making up and even at the very last moment putting on a pair of small pearl earrings and a single row of pearls. She heard the boy's voice call from the yard, Mrs. Bartholomew. She went outside, up there, straight overhead, see him? She stood for some moments, staring and listening, eyes dazzled by the sun. Then she managed to tune her ears to the thin trembling of lark song, cascading down, as it were, from a great vacuum. Oh, I hear it now, marvellous. But I still can't see a thing. It's farther up than you're looking, Mrs. Bartholomew. You look farther up. She laughed. I'm looking a million miles up now. Suddenly she gave a cry. In a moment of unexpected revelation, both sound and sight of the lark, from a height that seemed to her impossibly distant, merged together. She became conscious of a moment of great, simple, exquisite pleasure, and in the unremitting thrill of it, she actually threw up both her hands. It's the most beautiful thing in the world, she said. It's the most beautiful sound I ever heard. For the first time, she found herself actually extricating pleasure from the cottage the isolation, the marsh, and the entire simplicity of it all. Roger tells me he can do things, chores and so on, cooking. He paints and hangs wallpaper and does gardening and all that. He can even wait at table. Don't tell me we're about to give grand dinner parties. We've got this place for escape. I'm not talking about that. I, I just thought I'd ask him to paint and paper the kitchen. It's never been done. The window frames have got cracks you could put a mouse through. I thought something simple and clean, just plain red and white, to make it brighter. Good. You'll be telling me next you've cooked up some affection for the place. Sometime later, she appeared to change her mind about this. She was uneasy, she said, about leaving the boy alone in the house. You never knew quite with these people. Solution's easy. Stay down here for the week. You can then superintend, keep the watchful eye. The next day, the boy prepared to decorate the kitchen. Snow still covered the landscape outside, except for occasional dark islands melted by sun. Wearing a pair of old chamois gloves, she spent the greater part of the first day rubbing down the old paint with sandpaper, while the boy, wearing a thick tattered blue sweater with a heavy rolled collar, filled the many cracks in the walls with new plaster. There's a strange smell of fish about the place, she said once. At once he flushed sharply and apologised. He was afraid it was his old sweater she could smell. It was the one he went sea fishing in. Oh, you go fishing? You don't mean you actually catch things. Oh, yes, he went almost every night. He mostly caught small cod and plaice and occasionally soles. Did she like fish? He'd bring her something, a, a sole perhaps, next time he had any luck. That's terribly sweet of you. You marvellous man. Yes, I adore fish. 
by the end of the afternoon, she confessed to being absolutely worn out. Aren't you tired? No, he wasn't tired. He never got tired. Ah, but you're young, she said. You're young. The next morning, he arrived with a basket of fish, two fair-sized plates, a sole, and a small cod. By seven o'clock that evening, he was grilling the two plates for her and preparing to fry four cod steaks for himself. He had also cooked potatoes, made a salad, and sauce tartare. They ate in the sitting room by the light of a pair of candles in a golden glow. She never tired of saying how terribly marvellous the place was. I'll cook for you any time, he said, whenever you say. You dear boy. After the meal, he insisted on washing up the dishes while she sat curled up on the hearth in front of a wood fire, sipping brandy. Heavenly, all this. Absolutely heavenly, she said. I wouldn't have believed an evening could be so nice in this house. It was natural that she should presently turn to him like a fire drowsy cat and rest her head against his knee, a gesture he accepted with a nervous tautness. Suddenly he seized one of her hands, gripping and then caressing it with trembling eagerness. She treated all this with tolerant amusement and started teasing him. You're a very nice boy. I'll bet you have a thousand girls running after you. No, no. Oh, darling, of course you do. Oh, they're daft, most of them. Only half grown up. I suppose you're going to tell me you really like older women, do you? Naughty. Pour me another brandy, a nice big one. I like to feel it going round and round in me. Some time after this, as the spiritous hazy glow in her brain enlarged and deepened, she remembered saying, All right, you can kiss me if you like. Just for this once, I'll let you. There followed a moment or two of passionate ardour, abruptly cut off on his part by a great convulsive sigh. She remembered feeling his hands at her breasts, and then the entire heated, trembling episode started to fade. Some hours later she woke, alone, cold, the fire completely out. Shivering, she felt fuddled and stricken with a dry, shaking loneliness that lasted long after she had dragged herself to bed. Stella Bartholomew no longer hated her husband's dismal weekend cottage on the marsh. Her cleaning woman's 17-year-old son, Roger, was proving a success as a handyman around the place, and now that Barty had returned to his London office, the boy seemed ready to take on a more intimate role. Did you try to seduce me last night? They had been working for an hour or more on the kitchen the following morning when she suddenly flung this question at him. Are you mad with me? Oh, God, no! The girl likes to be asked if she minds about these things. You asked me. Did I? By God! I can't remember. Half a minute later, she suddenly did remember. Oh, yes. It seems to me it wasn't very successful. He had nothing to say to this bruising remark. If you're going to do these things, darling, you must learn to do them properly. It's an art, dear. No, no, I didn't mean it quite like that. You were very sweet, but there's a way. Was I drunk? I always think I'm a far nicer woman when I'm drunk. I think you're nice all the time. Sweet boy. Painfully, he stood staring at her with two clear, two brilliant eyes. All right, she said. You can kiss me if you like. That's what you want, isn't it? That's how it began last night. Yes, but this is morning. This is just friendly. He attempted to kiss her. She was amused, half averted her face, and suddenly turned away to make coffee. The snow's melting quite fast, she said. I wonder if your skylark is singing again. Spring came slowly and reluctantly to the marsh. By the very end of April, stretches of the long grey dikes were at last gold with kingcups. An impassioned, ceaseless song of skylarks filled the air. 
there came a day when she saw for the first time the blue and copper arrow of a kingfisher. Every weekend her husband came down from town filled with fresh appetite for the pure marshland air, delighted at her conversion at last to the pleasures of the simple life. Her praises of Roger, the gem of a boy who could cook, wait at table, clip hedges, clean drains, and generally impose transformations on the cottage, pleased him. He's done a great job on the garden, he said. I tell you what, I had an idea we'd paint the cottage walls white. You think he could do that too? Oh, anything. You only have to ask him. He worships you. Me? I thought it was you he worshipped. Well, well, worship or not. The great thing is that you've really started to like the place at last. On fine warm days in late June, she lay under a tree on a foam mattress in a bikini, sheltered from the track beyond the garden by a privet hedge. The sun and sea air had begun to work a certain transformation in her, and she looked much younger. The pleasure of teasing the boy had slightly worn off. She started to find his presence about the place mildly irritating. But one very hot July afternoon, in a deliberate attempt to re-stimulate the relationship, she slipped off the bikini and lay quite naked in the sun. She lay there for a good hour before realising that the boy wasn't coming back that afternoon. The surprise she had planned for him had failed. From across the marsh she heard one of its many church clocks strike four and then, some moments later, as if in echo, the slow funereal boom of a foghorn. The sun abruptly disappeared. A grey curtain of sea fog drifted in. She felt cold, ran into the house to dress, mixed herself a stiff pink gin and gulped the greater part of it quickly. It was past five o'clock when she heard the stutter of the boy's moped. Coming into the sitting room, he paused, clearly nervous, as if about to apologise for something. I thought you were coming to trim the lawn. Where the hell did you get to? He started to explain that his moped had gone wrong. He'd had to walk a couple of miles to a garage to get the necessary spare part. And then the fog came in. Suddenly she laughed. <laughs> and me without a stitch on, you silly darling. Why couldn't you have come? I wanted you to cook me, turn me over, get me brown all over. She put both arms round him and said she was sorry she'd spoken so sharply. Have a drink, she said. Warm you up. It's cold, that fog. Warm you up. No use making love when you're cold. No, he said. He wouldn't have a drink. In fact, it wasn't his intention to stay more than a few minutes anyway. I really came to tell you I wasn't coming any more. I got a job down at the power station. It's big money. She stared at him for fully half a minute. You're going to what? Oh, don't make me laugh. Of course you're coming again. Stonily, he resisted the invitation. I don't think it's fair to Mr. Bartholomew. The sublime innocence of this sentence left her for a few moments utterly at a loss for any words. Who's talking about being fair? Oh, grow up, for God's sake. We don't talk like that nowadays. It's 50-50, isn't it? We're in it together. I still don't think it's fair to Mr. Bartholomew. He's been very good to me. Amazing conclusion to come to. Amazing conclusion. We ran down to the coast last Saturday afternoon while you were resting. He wants to buy a boat. Oh, don't talk rubbish. Who the hell cares about boats? Suddenly she softened again. She lifted his hands to her breasts, guiding them into movement slow and caressive. His response to this was as cold as the sea fog outside. What the hell's the matter with you? It's like trying to rouse the dead. The bitterness rose to a fearful stridency. But then you couldn't anyway, could you? You never even had one good short innings, did you? You never even once even remotely made it. He stood white-faced, unable to say a word. The following weekend, Bartholomew found her deep in gloom and petulance, drinking as early as nine in the morning. Her talk was again of how she hated the marsh, the sea fog, the foghorns, the herons, the grey dykes, and above all, the cottage, and being there alone. But where's Roger? Where's the boy? Mr. High and Mighty got too big for himself. 
withdrawn his labor, as they say. It's always the way with these people. You treat them as equals and they spit on you. Oh, this is ridiculous. The boy's always been so friendly. There must be some explanation. You go and seek it. I hate bad feeling, and I must say, I, I got awfully fond of the boy in a way. And what's all this about buying a boat? Yes, Bartholomew said, he had thought of buying a boat. He'd always wanted to, and it seemed that the boy knew of one, fair-sized and pretty serviceable and not all that expensive. You'll go alone if you do, she said. Boat me no boats. Bartholomew was late coming home that evening, and she went to bed securely drunk without him, so that it was almost midday on Sunday before she was sober enough to ask, Well, did you see our late and unlamented jack-of-all-trades? Yes. And what about the boat? Did you buy the pea-green boat? They were, Bartholomew said, going to try it out that afternoon. And does it sail, or has it got an engine? Or do you have to row, jolly old row? It had sails and an auxiliary. Needless to say, the jolly Roger will do all the work. Bartholomew said that he wished she wouldn't talk like that. It wasn't fair on the boy. He'd talked to him yesterday for a long, long time, and he'd got the impression that there was something big on his mind that he couldn't talk about. He really thought the boy looked quite ill. These last words affected her so much that she lay on her bed all afternoon in a stupor of self-chastisement that brought her at last to tears. She ached to talk to the boy, to explain, to apologize, to redeem herself. Bartholomew, returning home about eight o'clock, was a man as pleased with himself as a child with a new toy. He could speak of nothing but the boat, how she handled the dream she was. I decided to take a month off and give her a thorough go. I thought we might even take her up the Seine, say as far as Rouen. Well, he could count her out on that, she said. The simple life on shore was bad enough. The boy's never been abroad before. I thought it would be a great experience for him. Really? Hadn't there been some talk of his working at the power station? How was he arranging that? Oh, I talked him out of that. It isn't the job for him. He's an outdoor man. Oh, indeed, she said. He seemed all of a sudden to have taken an almighty strong interest in the boy. Well, frankly, I have. I got sort of attached to him. Attached? She seized on the word like an alcoholic tigress. And what the freezing hell did he mean by attached? He's very sensitive. Oh, indeed, how charming. And had the boy by any chance become attached to? I don't think it's a thing to be sarcastic about. He's going through a very trying period. He's all tangled up about something. I'd like to give him some understanding. Oh, let's all shed salt tears for the cabin boy, she said. Poor little cabin boy. She could only hope they both enjoyed their long French honeymoon. I ought to belt you for that. But God help me, I doubt if you're worth belting. No, she said. Then he could pour her a drink instead. A good, long, big whiskey. Then she could wish him luck good health, bon voyage, bless the bride, and happy nights on honeymoon. Alone on a day in August, she walked across the marsh along the dikes. A keen wind, quite cold, was blowing in from the sea, ruffling and bending brown feathered reeds, purple torches of loose strife. The towers of the power station some distance down the coast had the appearance of some curious castle ancient but new, the color of gray sand. It was her intention to walk the four miles or so to the sea. She would, she felt, feel freer by the sea. A solitary imprisonment on the marsh, alone in the cottage, an entire month of the simple life had become tolerable no longer. She had to walk, see the sea, acquaint herself with a new horizon. Winter, as she had always felt it did, had once again begun in August. The voices of seagulls were harsh on the wind. There was a cold, clenching touch of salt in the air, and ahead of her a heron rose from the dikes in slow flight, a grey ghost watching for prey. <laughs> 